There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, Right. For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. In four weeks, the typical Noom user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. How does that make you feel? Maybe you feel anxious or stressed, fear, outrage, or even depression when you think about your debt. If this is you, please first know you are definitely not alone in those feelings. Debt is one of the number one reasons for anxiety and depression, and has even been described as a heavy weight that is pressing down on you every second of the day. Melanie Lockhart, the brains behind the successful blog Dear Debt and the Mental Health and Wealth podcast, is here sharing her story of dealing with debt in the midst of depression and how she paid off over $81,000. You're listening to Millennial Money with award-winning money expert and serial entrepreneur, Shauna Come to Gain, where we flip the script on the old school approach to everything your parents never taught you about money. Each week, Shauna creates a safe space by talking with special guests from around the world about money wellness, entrepreneurship, traveling like a boss, and what makes millennials tick. Unique stories, trailblazing perspectives, tips, tricks, and everything there is to know about money. Find it all here as you uncover your money story and unlock the life you want to live. Pretty cool, right? Here's Shauna, money expert, Indiana Hoosier, and burger aficionado. If you don't know Melanie yet, I'm really happy to introduce her to you. She's as real as they come and created a career from her whole mental health struggles dealing with debt, which I think is a pretty awesome outcome to having debt. Melanie's story, it's just like yours and mine. It's really easy to get into debt like (laughs) really, really easy. And it takes some grit and hard work to get out of debt, but it is definitely more than doable. I have been wanting to do this episode for a really long time because I feel like we need to talk more about mental health and wealth. There's a real connection there. It's the whole basis behind my creating the Money Mindset Journal that I have and all of my podcast episodes around money mindset, because this is definitely something I have struggled with myself. I have struggled with my money mindset for years, still do, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. So I think stories like Melanie's really need to be heard and shared because she was in the midst of debt, but found her way out. And I think if you're sitting in that place right now, I want you to know that you can find your way out. I said uh, before we started recording, I'm a, I'm a big admirer of yours, and I've been following you for quite a while now. And I don't know, don't know what took me so long to have you on the show, but I I just I love uh, the message you share around debt, around mental health, and I think these are conversations that 
that we need to be having more more often. So many people are suffering from depression and all sorts of mental health issues, particularly around money and particularly in the time we're in right now in, in yes. 2020. So I think your message is just is just so important to share. I'm just curious, you know, why does like why does debt lead to to depression and other mental health issues? Like what actually happens inside us that causes that sort of response to debt? Yeah, something that I think, you know, I've realized over the years is that debt causes depression because you are continually paying for your past and you feel like you can't enjoy your present or plan for your future. So, you know, when you're paying off debt, you're paying for something that has already happened, that you're already charged, and you're having this monthly payment, which is usually a pretty good chunk of your paycheck. And so you're kind of, you know, using your money that you've earned today that you've worked very hard for and paying this thing from the past. And I feel like it can lead to this feeling of being stuck. Right. I know when I was paying off my debt, I felt ex incredibly stuck. Like I couldn't move forward until the debt was paid off that I was, you know, um, kind of beholden to this debt as long as I had it. And I had a lot of shame around the debt because I got it from NYU, which is a fancy <laughs> private school. You know, I had an arts degree and I felt really uh, guilty because I went, you know, there and I felt shame because I couldn't find a job to pay it back. And I think there are so many different reasons that it can lead to depression. And, you know, if you have credit card debt, there's obviously a lot of shame around that, potentially other issues that you're dealing with. And, you know, it's just a stressful situation in general when you are, you know, paying off debt and dealing with interest. And, you know, it often feels like you're moving two steps forward, one step back, especially with the interest. And, you know, I think it can just be a perfect storm for this situational depression. I, you made such a good point, And I haven't thought about it this way. But I think it probably is something that resonates with so many people is a lot of people have student loan debt of, of varying degrees. And, you're right. There is a sense of guilt if you graduate with that type of debt and then you're not able to get a job, which is the reality for for so many people. But we don't talk about that. I mean, it's just you're supposed to go to school. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to take out however much in debt to, you know, to take out. And, and then you're just supposed to assume that on the other side, somehow you get you get a big job with a big salary. And that doesn't always happen. Yeah, the narrative is broken. You know, I feel like a lot of people in my generation, you know, we did what we were told, like, go to a good school, work hard, and you're going to get a good job and pay it back. And, you know, that is not what happened. You know, I went to a good school, I worked hard, and I struggled after I graduated and, you know, was making 10 to $12 an hour those first two years after having a master's degree. And that was incredibly painful and something that brought me a lot of shame and depression and also anxiety. And, you know, I feel like, especially right now, given the recession and COVID and everything that's happening, like this narrative needs to change because this is not like the main way that you're going to find success or financial stability. And like, I'm not saying right. that college isn't great or that college isn't for a lot of people, but I think it's not for everybody. And I also think, you know, college costs really need to go down. I, I really hope that that's yes. the bubble that bursts next because I'm like, this is not sustainable. I can't imagine being a parent right now and trying to pay for college. It's like, oh, save up 200 grand for like, you know, 50 grand a year tuition. It's just crazy. Yeah, it does. It blows my mind. And I, I teach at a university here in Los Angeles. And to be able to see sort of like the underbelly of, of how it actually operates and, mm -hmm. um, you know, how they function with money. I'm not going to, you know, say anything too damaging, but <laughs> I'll just say that it's very fascinating when you look under yes. the hood <laughs> of how universities uh -huh. work and how they operate with their money. And it's like, okay, wow. And you have to keep charging students more and more, more and more tuition. And, um, you know, it's just, it just really blows my mind. <laughs> mm hmm. I could totally. probably go on for hours about that. But I, you know, why, why do you think we don't talk more openly about the correlation between between mental health and money more? Is it just because money is already like this taboo topic? And then if we add something on top of it, but why do you think we don't have more co open conversations about this? 
Yeah, I think money is still taboo. Mental health is still taboo, even though it's, you know, getting a little bit more of the limelight right now. And I think when you put the two together, it's really this, you know, perfect storm, this combination that is, you know, so riddled with shame and being taboo. And I feel like people really don't want to talk about the correlation between money and mental health because they see it as a personal failing. You know, they, mm. they feel like if I'm in debt, it's my fault. I failed. Whereas right. they're not looking at the fact that for the past 30 years, wages have not kept up with inflation, that higher education costs are like, <laughs> you know, crazy. They're not looking at the big picture. And, you know, instead they just think, oh, it's all my fault. And I'm not downplaying personal responsibility. I think we should all, you know, do our best to be financially responsible and take responsibility for our choices and our actions and our money. But I also think it's super important to kind of zoom out and look at the big picture as well. And, you know, we were given a deck of cards that was, you know, <laughs> not going to get us to win. And so, you know, I think there's this shame because we live in such an individualistic culture that it just feels like a huge personal failing if we are dealing with money and mental health issues. And, you know, something that I talk about a lot is that it can go either way. You know, your mental health issues can affect your finances. So, you know, when I'm depressed, I stop caring about money. I don't, you know, really look at my savings and I spend carelessly. Right. And on the converse, you know, when I was in debt, I had tons of anxiety and depression because I felt so worthless by being in so much debt. And so it can go either way. And, you know, I feel like people just aren't equipped with the language to be able to talk about what these issues are, or they feel like it's just them. I get that so much that people feel like, oh, I thought I was the only one dealing with this. And that's been th the beautiful part about talking about this more is that once you just open that door and start talking about it, then people come out of the woodwork and they're like, oh my gosh, I felt that way too. I felt that way too. I'm dealing with this right now. I'm so glad you talked about this. And, you know, just think about all of the topics that, you know, we just don't talk about that people are dealing with every day by themselves. And we should bring these topics to light because they're an issue for so many people. I couldn't agree more. I, it's really been, I think, about five years that I've really struggled with my own mental health and had a lot of anxiety. And then I had a weird freak injury two years ago and, and became partially deaf. And that totally changed my my mental health and anxiety levels. But I think yeah. about, you know, in my family, we didn't talk about anything about mental health. We didn't talk about therapy. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about any of those things. And I so wish those topics would have been normalized because I could think of so many times in my own life, even as a child, when I probably did have depression or anxiety and I just didn't have the vocabulary around it, nor the tools mm -hmm. in the toolkit to be able to figure out how to, you know, back myself out of it. And I, I just feel like it's so many people are sitting in in anxiety, especially now, anxiety, depression, whatever level that might be for you, and they are carrying that shame around that maybe this means they failed mm -hmm. or they're failing their partner or their family or whatever it may be. And it's it's really it, it saddens me that that people are are sitting in that place and just not knowing that there are tools out there to to help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's, you know, such a sad situation that we don't have the vocabulary or the openness to address these issues. And I think, you know, as you mentioned, you know, from childhood to adolescence to on, you know, onward, you know, there are these issues that a lot of people are dealing with it. They might not even recognize. Like I've, you know, spoken with people who are, you know, in their thirties and they're like, I'm just realizing now that a lot of my behavior is based in anxiety when I thought it was all of yeah. these other things, but I'm just, you know, realizing now that that's what it was. And I think the more we talk about it, the more that we'll be able to recognize it and break the taboo and, you know, be able to have those conversations with future generations. And, you know, I think we really need to separate this idea that it's a personal feeling or that there's something wrong with you. You know, if you had a broken arm or a broken foot, you would go to the doctor and get help and no one would think anything of it. And I think we need to have that same kind of thought process. If there's not something okay with your brain and your mental health, you need to go to a doctor or a counselor and, and get help. And there's no shame in that because, you know, something's obviously not working. Something's not in alignment. And that is not a personal failing. It just means that there's more work to do and, you know, help that you can get. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm wondering if you would, if you could share what are some of the things that, that you have done or that you even currently do that help you with, with your mental health that has sort of helped you other than, of course, paying off your debt, which is probably a huge anxiety reliever. Mm-hmm. But what are some of the other things that you do practically that might be able to help people if, if they are in this situation? Yes, definitely paying off debt super helped my mental health. It's like a huge, you know, burden and weight was lifted. But, you know, that's not to say that I haven't had mental health issues since. And obviously, given the current climate, you know, it's just ripe for depression and anxiety. And, you know, that's something that I think many of us are dealing with. And potentially, you know, a lot of people are dealing with situational depression and anxiety for the first time, maybe. You know, it's definitely a situation that kind of calls for that. And I think, you know, something that's been helping me through is really trying to be mindful of the moment. So, you know, there's mindfulness and that's something that I've been trying to practice more. And really all that is, is really trying to stay present in the moment. You know, so much of our life is spent ruminating about the past or worrying about the future that it's you know, so rare that we actually just kind of enjoy this moment for what it is and what's really happening. And so I try to ground myself and say, I am safe. I am healthy. And given the current climate right now, just saying those two words, I am safe and I am healthy. That makes me feel rich. That makes me feel wealthy, you know, because so many people are suffering right now. And so to be able to just kind of ground myself with those phrases really helps. Um, I have a thing that's called a what makes me feel good list. And so I you know, <laughs> Love it. wrote down all of these things that make me feel good. You know, petting my cat, drinking tea, taking a bath, watching trashy television, having living room dance parties. And I wrote it because, you know, when you're in this anxious, depressed state, like you're super heightened and your cognitive thinking and reasoning isn't so, you know, it's not working to its highest capacity. So it's not easy or normal to be like, okay, this is what I'm going to do to take care of myself. So having that list just on my fridge is like, okay, I don't feel well. What's one thing that I can do right now to feel better? And, you know, it's not a a cure or, you know, something that's going to completely change everything, but it does help. And, And, you know, even if it just changes your mood a little bit, you know, that is just so wonderful. And, um, another tip that I would love to share is really trying to re-engineer your mood through music. So yesterday, for example, I was Mm. in a foul mood. (laughs) Like I, I was just in a foul mode. I was so angry. I was so upset. I was kind of depressed. I just was like not feeling it at all whatsoever. And then I just put on some Britney Spears. I put on some Ciara, And I was just like, yeah, like, I'm feeling it now. Let's just dance. Let's just move. Let's listen to some bubblegum pop and some R&B. And I started feeling better. And I looked it up and there's, you know, scientific studies that prove that your mood can improve by listening to upbeat music. So I think, you know, you can definitely try to engineer your mood and listen to positive music that kind of gets you in a better mood in a different place. I love that idea. I mean, we definitely use music whenever uh, we're not feeling great or anxiety comes up. And I think what you're talking about is so great because these are like fairly simple things that you can do. I mean, making a list of the things that make you happy, that's an easy thing. And some of those things is like, okay, well, yeah, let me just take myself out of my anxiety or my depression for a moment or whatever it may be. And let me try one of these things. And sometimes it's like, wow, that was so easy to make me feel better. I didn't need a lot. I mm-hmm. just needed a, I needed to watch trashy TV or I need, I needed my tea or whatever it may be. You know, and so I think that's always great to share with people is like, it doesn't always take a lot of money to, to do something. Or, you know, a lot of people say, well, I don't have money to go to a therapist. There's lots of other ways to do this to kind of, like you say, like re-engineer what's going on in, in your mind and in your body. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. 
what could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com slash etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. We've all spent more time with family lately. It can feel like old times, but your mind is on the future too, and what you can do to shape it. At Sandy Spring Bank, we work with clients to help them grow and protect their money with wealth management, trust services, and insurance, so they can enjoy today and ultimately pass along their wealth. We believe real banking is a conversation. Let's talk about your dreams. Visit sandyspringbank.com wealth. Wealth and insurance products are not FDIC insured, not guaranteed, and may lose value. It's Tuesday and we got another Ask Shauna and this one comes from Bethany and Bethany says, Hey Shauna, I'm a Millennium Money listener and I started listening to your podcast right when the pandemic hit. I am honestly so thankful for the timing and kind of glad the pandemic had me at home because I finally got serious about my financial literacy and your podcast has been a big part of that. What I am struggling with now though is almost obsessive negative thoughts about my financial situation. Obviously, my current financial situation is due to decisions I have made in the past that can no longer be changed. However, every time I see online or read tips from people regarding finances who say they never got into debt because of X, Y, or Z, or you should start investing when you were 20, I have student loans and I'm in my early 30s and didn't start investing until I was 28, I get really discouraged and angry at myself. I want to have a positive outlook and keep growing financially literate. However, I'm starting to feel like all the advice columns and financial literacy gurus are causing me to be very harsh with myself, sometimes to the point of waking up in the middle of the night upset because I'm not on par with other people who are financially successful. I want to get out of debt and I want to make progress and keep working on my financial literacy, but I don't want it to have a negative impact on my mental health. Are there any practical tips you can give to help me stay the course and stay positive? Obviously, the Millennial Money podcast and community is great, and I'm so thankful for it. Never stop. Wow, Bethany, I am so happy that you sent over this question to me, and I couldn't agree with you more, honestly. I really feel like the money industry is set up to make you feel like you're failing. That is the objective, because if you feel like you're failing, the cycle of... uh, of going into debt, of buying things you don't need, of not paying attention to your money, all of that just continues because you're in a negative mindset. 
This is how companies make money. And unfortunately, it takes some serious work to really counteract this in your mind. One of the best steps you can take is to get super laser focused on the vision you have for your life. This is not 100% fixed, but this will really help you diminish what doesn't fit into that vision. And people love to shout from the rooftops how much they are saving or investing or how much debt they paid off. I mean, there are so many different articles about that. And those things should be celebrated. They are amazing, but it doesn't mean that you aren't making smart money moves with your situation. It does not diminish where you're at or any progress that you are indeed making. So here are a couple tricks that work. I create what I call a beliefs versus fears list. Write out all your money beliefs, good and not good, along with the fears that you have around money. Then next to it, write out a money truth list. List all the things that are true and good, like you have already started investing, you are learning about personal finance, you are paying off your student loans. These are truths. These are things that you are already doing. The trick is to recognize and really send signals to your brain that you are making progress, no matter what those articles say. Also, it allows you to see fears and beliefs that you might have that aren't serving you any longer, that maybe are keeping you stuck in in certain places. A gratitude list works much in the same way. Listing out one or two things each day that you're grateful for keeps you focused on what you have versus what you don't have. Remember, all of these articles and even other money experts, if you will, they want you to focus on what you don't have, how much you aren't saving, where you're you're not at this particular point. But I want you to focus on what you do have, where you are at, because those are the things that are going to really start to change your mindset around money. So call BS on them <laughs> and create your own list. Take back some of the power. And from, from a money standpoint, I like to break down goals into, into mini goals. So if I had like $5,000 to pay off, let me break that down into something smaller so I can feel like I'm actually making progress. So if I wanted to pay it off in, in six months, that's $833 a month and $27 a day. Still sizable amount. <laughs> but I can decide that I can either make this work or maybe I need to stretch that payback period back to make it a smaller goal that actually works with the money I do have. So focus on what you can do and not what you can't. If you can only invest $100 a month or $50 a month or $20 a month, celebrate that because that's progress. All of those articles are talking about some fictitious person, usually, unless it's an interview piece with someone, but they're written from a more generic standpoint. Okay, at, at this age, you should have this much saved and be invested and have your money spread out in these certain places. And while they're good because they maybe bring to light some things you need to focus on, it's also just take it with a grain of salt because it's not it's not your life. <laughs> and this is personal. Money money is personal, but money is also a portal to the life you want to live. So what things can you actually do with the money you have? Can you make that money grow in any way, shape, or form? Focus on those positives. I also like to keep what I call a fun fund, something small where I'm only tasked to pull out money to do something fun with it. I turn this fund into something that it brings me great joy whenever I'm feeling frustrated or anxious with my money. I go into my fun fund. I pull out a little bit of money. It sounds counterintuitive. Like, why would you go pull money out when you're feeling anxious about money? But again, we've got to rewire those signals in our brain that have been ingrained in us to say, you're doing it wrong. You're not where you should be. We need to rewire that. And it just takes some work. So these are just tricks, again, to help you recognize progress and really put money in its place as a tool. And work to let go of some of those negative feelings. It's not that they're not going to be there. They're going to be there. But let's see if like maybe 70% of the time or 80% of the time, we can focus on something positive. So just like when you're, you're dating someone and you suddenly recognize all the things you don't like, 
It's easy to be that way as well with your money, really easy. But I want to encourage you to take each day at a time and say, what can I do today? And then celebrate any progress, even celebrate no progress and just take tomorrow as it comes. So what can I do today? Maybe I'm not the picture in that article. I don't care. Today I did this. Today I checked on my credit score. Today I negotiated my my credit card interest rate lower. Today I just looked at my bank account. Today I made a conscious decision not to spend some money here and to reroute it towards one of my goals. What did I do today? That to me is where the success comes. Yeah, totally. And you know, everything that's on my what makes me feel good list doesn't cost any money. It doesn't take that much time either. And you know, they're just simple tactics that I can do like literally right now to try to make myself feel better. And sometimes that just means going outside for a 20 minute walk. And something that I like to do is I like to go on a flower hunt. And what I say Ooh. by that is like, I like to go look and, you know, hunt for all the flowers and see how many different types of flowers there are in my neighborhood. And that really helps me stay mindful. And I actually literally smell the roses when I see them. And, you know, that's kind of a beautiful thing too, is just be like, wow, look at these beautiful roses and see how beautiful they smell. And that kind of helps me stay mindful and in the moment and also remember that there is beauty in this world. And I think, you know, something that I have really been focusing on in the past year or two is really focusing on how can I cultivate more moments of beauty, joy, and pleasure in my life? Because those things will help me be happier and improve my mood and make living more enjoyable. You know, life is hard in all aspects. And, you know, right now is an incredibly difficult moment for literally everybody. And so what I always try to ask myself is, what can I do right now to have more moments of beauty, joy, and pleasure? And, you know, I can't answer that for you, but I know how I can answer that for myself. And I have to actively try to go out and and do those things so I can experience that. That's so great because it's it's about being very purposeful in the day. And I think that's just a, such a great way to um, to keep you really grounded in the moment and to keep that mindfulness really, you know, in the forefront. Uh, I want I want to talk a little bit about about the debt. I know you you said you paid off about eighty one thousand of student loans. It took you somewhere around mm-hmm. nine years. Mm-hmm. What could you share about that process of of actively paying off the debt? You know, how did you how did you go about paying it off in that time frame? And um, you know, did some things work, some things not work? I'd love for you to just share a little bit about that journey. Yeah, definitely. So I paid off $81,000 in student loan debt, actually probably more because that's not including interest. I don't know exactly how much I paid in interest. Right. So, you know, I just say 81,000, but it was probably closer to six figures. Um, and you know, most of that came from NYU. I, I got 58,000 in, in student loans from NYU, 23,000 from Cal State Long Beach. And, you know, I went to school at two different times. So I graduated in 2006 with my bachelor's and 2011 with my master's. And so, you know, there was some time in between that I was working. And so, you know, when I graduated from undergrad, I kind of just treated my debt like any other bill and didn't really think about it. And I paid the minimum for the first five years. So, you know, it's like I paid debt for nine years total. Um, You know, for the first five years, I was just paying the minimum. And then, you know, around year four, I went back to school and accrued a lot more debt. Right. And it wasn't until after I graduated (laughs) NYU where I was like, Oh, I just like tripled my debt load. And now I see how much interest is accruing every day. And that's when I really got serious. So, you know, I paid off all of my debt in nine years, but you know, kind of like the sexier version of the story is that I paid off 68,000 of it in four and a half years after graduating. And so, you know, I would say the first half of the journey, I was very nonchalant, kind of just paying the minimum, didn't really care about it, you know, had all of these kind of money mindset blocks of like, oh, everyone has student loan debt or student loan is the good debt, you know? And then I really had to address those mindset you know, beliefs and, and change them in order to pay off debt. And I was like, you know what? Maybe student loans aren't the good debt. And if everyone has debt, maybe I want to be different. And, 
you know, I had to mm, really yeah. face those in order to get in the mindset of like, okay, this is going to be a long journey. It's not going to be easy and I'm going to do it. And so I was living in Portland, Oregon at the time and my rent was $400 and you know, that really <laughs> helped. I, I was sharing a studio with my then partner. Um, so that helped and I didn't have a car. I didn't have health insurance and I was side hustling all of the time. And so, you know, something that worked for me is really earning more. I know a lot of people focus on frugality, which I think is great. I think, you know, frugality is a really great first step for a lot of people. But for me, I was already a minimalist. I hardly had anything to my name. I'm not a big consumer at all. So, you know, I was able to cut back on a few things, but, you know, I quickly hit that threshold and was like, okay, I can't right. cut back anymore. So, like, how am I going to pay off this debt when I've cut everything out and I'm still, like, hardly making any money? And so, you know, I came to the conclusion that the only way I'm actually going to pay off this debt is to earn more. And so I started side hustling like crazy. I was, you know, working as a brand ambassador, as a pet sitter, as an event organizer, uh, I worked at an overnight rave selling water bottles once. Uh, you know, I would find all of these crazy gigs on Craigslist and TaskRabbit. And actually, funny story, I looked at Craigslist gigs like a couple weeks ago, and there was a gig for someone to take temperatures at a party. So, you know, there are tons of crazy gigs that are on Craigslist and TaskRabbit. And I was just so, you know, like focused at the time. I was like, I will literally do anything to try to pay off this debt. And then, you know, I started my blog, Dear Debt in 2013, because I was so depressed about my debt in the year before. And I was like, if I just, you know, use all of this energy that I'm so depressed about my debt and try to put it into something positive, like actually writing and trying to be accountable, like maybe I can actually pay off this debt. And, you know, the blog changed my life. It led to a book and it led to a freelance writing career, which that significantly, you know, helped my income. And I was able to get out of kind of this low nonprofit pay trap and, you know, self-employment actually really helped me pay off my debt. And so, you know, I think it's not necessarily a journey that a lot of people have because a lot of people, when they quit their jobs, they're nervous to go to self-employment because it might be a pay cut. Whereas for me, I was like, when I finally found a nonprofit job two years after graduation, it was making $31,000 as an events and communications coordinator. And a year later, I had all of these side hustles with my writing and my blog, and I was making the same amount of money on the side. And so, you know, I came to this conclusion that if I quit my job, I think I'll be able to make more money. And I was able to double my income that first year to 60000 And so, you know, when your wow. rent's $400 and you're making 60000 yeah. I was able to throw a lot more money towards my debt. And, you know, so I, I definitely say, you know, paying more than the minimum really helped. Earning a lot more money. Um, you know, something that I can't ignore was having a low cost of living. And I will just say that I did not like Portland. I really wanted to move back to LA so badly because I hated the rain. I hated the weather. I just, it wasn't my scene, but I knew that it was way <laughs> yes. more affordable than LA. So I was like, I just need to stay here until the debt's paid off. And like my debt-free treat, my, my debt-free dream is going to be moving back to LA. And I moved back to LA like six months after I paid off my debt and it was great. So, you know, that really helped was having a low cost of living. And I, I made that, you know, conscious choice of like, okay, I don't like it here, but it's what's going to be best for my finances for now. I, I love that you share that because you know, a lot of times people don't want to make the short term, uh, take the short term pain basically of staying somewhere or staying in a job or doing something they don't want to do in order to really throw a lot of money onto whatever kind of debt they have. But I mean, that was a really like a short ish chapter in your in your life. And now you're living in a place that you really want to live and, and you're debt free and you you know, you're you're in a different um a different place in your life. So that short term, I mean, in the, in the long run, it's really just a small amount of time to make that sacrifice in order to now be on, on the other side of that. Definitely. And I, you know, realize that I can either suffer now or I can suffer later. And, you know, as we get <laughs> older, it's like, it's really hard to be like an older broke person. And I was like, I don't want to be yes. that person. Like it's already sucky to be a broke person in your twenties and thirties. And so, 
you know, something that kept me going was this thing that I called a debt-free dream list. And so it was all of the things that I wanted to do after paying off debt. And so that was move back to LA. That was get cats because I really wanted to have a pet, but I also knew that I couldn't afford it if I was really focused on paying off debt. I wanted to take my mom to Italy because she had never been to Europe. And so these were all of these things that I was like, this is what I'm going to do when I pay off my debt. You know, I'm living really hardcore life right now, side hustling all the time, you know, not living the life that I want, but doing this now for this specific period of time will allow me to live the life that I want later. And I'm never going to go back. And, you know, I'm happy to say that I did move back to LA. I adopted two beautiful cats, Miles and Thelonious, and I took my mom to Italy and it's been great to be debt free since and to be able to pursue other business projects without, you know, the threat of debt being in the background. And so Having that debt-free dream list really helped me kind of battle the debt fatigue because debt fatigue is real. And, you know, debt fatigue is when after paying, you know, tons of money for a long period of time, because for me, I was making, you know, four figure payments for, for years, you know, and when you realize you're like, oh my God, I have to pay a thousand dollars or more for literally years you know, that it just weighs on you. So, you know, I had debt fatigue and I was like, I'm so tired of paying off debt. Like, I just hate this. But, you know, I, I took a few breaks where I spent a little money on myself or, you know, I, I focused on saving rather than debt. But for the most part, it was that debt-free dream list that really kind of kept me motivated and, and deal with those times where I was just like, oh, I want to give up. This is so exhausting and boring and I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> If you could go back in time, would you would you still get the master's degree or would you uh, would you change your your course of it? You know, that is hard to say because given everything that's happened since with the blog in my career, you know, I definitely think it's worth it, but if you would have asked me like the first 2 years after, I'd be like, <laughs> "No, I I shouldn't have gone to grad school. I shouldn't have gotten that degree. No way." But, you know, it's like I, I did live in New York, which was on my bucket list, which was nice. I met, you know, my best friend who lives in New York still. And, you know, in a weird, crazy way, it's led to this blog and this book and this career. So, like, it, it's a difficult answer, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's complicated, as as all things are. But it's it's a story that show that it's taken you to a really cool place. I mean, you, you have a podcast, a Mental Health and Wealth. You created this wonderful retreat for women called Lola. I mean, I think it's so great to share that because beautiful things have been born out of this very difficult time and that that can happen for other people as well. Yes. It's so funny that you mentioned that. Like I have a friend who was like, Melanie, you turned your pain into your passion. I was like, yeah, I, I did. <laughs> and you know, it really helped me survive because like I said, in 2012, I was super depressed and I was just getting sick of my own crap. So I was like, I need to do something different. And that's when I started the blog just as a way to keep myself accountable and try to build a, a different life because I was miserable. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think those are just such great stories to share. Well, I, I'm just curious as, as we wrap up here, I, I want to leave. I know there are a lot of people listening, I should say, that are that are sitting in this time, in this moment, in this year. And I've heard from so many listeners who actually have had to turn to debt. They've They've had to use credit cards maybe more mm -hmm. than than they would like to. Uh, a couple listeners said that they decided just to go back to school because they got laid off. They don't know what else to do, and they had to take out student loans. And and all of that brings – I mean, there's so many unknowns that, that we're in right now. All of that brings up all of these different emotions, um, either extreme mental health or just general anxiety. So – like what pearls of wisdom would you leave us with if someone who's sitting in that in that moment about you know their money and and mental health and maybe even just how to frame it to themselves so um you know they can keep some level of of sanity yeah definitely and you know i would like to just kind of start with an example you know my blog dear debt was really about writing these breakup letters to debt you know, like, dear debt, we're done. I never want to see you again. And so I wrote a lot of these letters. And then I also invited other people to write these letters. And a lot of my letters were like bitter and angry and like, I can't wait to, you know, <laughs> dump you. And, you know, I actually had a few letters from people who were like, dear debt, thank you for allowing me to not be homeless. Thank you for keeping food yeah. on the table. And, you know, when I started getting those letters with this different positive reframe, I was like, wow, this is so 
powerful and so different than my experience. And so I just wanted to share that with people right now that, you know, if you're dealing with credit card debt, because that's what you need to keep food on the table or pay your rent or pay your bills, like it's an unfortunate situation. But if that's what helps you continue to live and eat, there is no shame in that. And, you know, I just think of those letters all of the time because those people were so happy to even have access to that credit to be able to do that. And, you know, they're like, dear dad, thanks for, you know, the food on the table and being able to provide childcare and to be able to provide, you know, money for rent and all of these kinds of things. And so, you know, just reframe it that way. If that's what you're turning to right now, just to survive, like these are, you know, you know, phrase of the century, unprecedented times. And, you know, we just, don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going on. There's no level of certainty at all whatsoever. And this is something that we're navigating for the first time and we don't have the answers. There's just no formula. And so we're all just relying on what we can to get by. And if that means debt or credit cards, don't internalize that shame. If you've gotten, you know, laid off, don't internalize that shame. Like so many people have, If your income has taken a hit, like, welcome to the club. Literally almost everybody (laughs) I know has, you know, taken a hit in some way, shape, or form. And I think it's important that we try not to internalize this as a personal failure and just realize that, you know, the system is broken and there are a lot of things out of our control. And let's do the best that we can with the resources that we have. And, you know, if we do have more time right now, Let's focus on building up those skills, maybe looking up different opportunities, you know, doing something that you've always wanted to do. And I think now is a beautiful time to try to figure out, you know, what makes me happy without money? Like, what do I really enjoy? And like I said, really cultivating that joy, beauty, and pleasure, you know, in these incredibly dark times. And, you know, on my podcast, The Mental Health and Wealth Show, I had a guest who was saying that joy is a superpower in these times. You know, if you can cultivate yeah. joy, that's like a superpower to deal with these insane times. And so I just want people to be able to reframe, you know, any debt or any layoffs or any income hits and not take it personally. And, and like I said, something that really grounds me when I'm, you know, worried about work and, oh my gosh, my income and this and that. And, you know, I just start spiraling. I just start breathing and try to get into the moment and say, I am healthy. I am safe. And you think of all the people who are dealing with coronavirus, people who have dealt with incredible racial injustice. I mean, just to be able to say, I'm healthy, I am safe. I mean, wow, (laughs) we're doing a lot better than a lot of people. So I think we should take immense gratitude in that. I am on a personal mission after talking with Melanie to actively search for more joy, beauty, and pleasure in each day. I go for about, I've been trying to do this since March, about a five mile walk almost every morning. And we always see little bunnies around in the morning. It's something just so simple, but it brings me so much joy and really helps me focus on what's good and not always what I need to do or what I need to pay that day. Who knew that bunnies could bring me such joy? So such a simple trick, but with, I think, mind blowing results. If you wanted to connect with Melanie and reach out to her, you can find her lots of places at deardat.com, lolaretreat.com, mentalhealthandwealth.com, on the Mental Health and Wealth podcast, and also on her website, melanielocker.com. Hey, you. Yes, you. Before you go, we want to say thanks for listening to this episode of Millennial Money. For all the links, tags, and ads you've heard on today's episode, check out the show notes or go to mmoneypodcast.com, where you'll find more episodes to share with your friends. While you're at it, leave us a review and make sure to subscribe wherever you listen so you don't miss out on all the money tips and tricks that will take you from a millennial regular to a millennial money expert. See you back here in a few days with a fresh new episode. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? 
Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. 